take a little bit of a step back and look at what is it about Java that makes it so special. And clearly, if you've been watching any of the numbers over the last five years, Java continues to be number one on the Tayobi Index. Um, year over year, month over month, Java maintains its number one position in the development world, so clearly you're working on the right technology. But why is that? Why is it the number one development platform after over 20 years, and it's grown to have over 10 million developers, when it really started out as just a set-top box technology coming out of Sun Microsystems Lab, but it's grown to run on billions of devices from the very small devices and smart cards all the way up to the very large high-end server systems, running on billions of devices and desktops all around the world. And when you stop and think about why that is, clearly there's a completeness there and a scalability and security. Um, but I think a really key part of why Java continues to be number one and is um, desired not only by developers but also employers and customers is the fact that it's the way it's developed. Open and collaboratively with the community, with you, Java developers, all around the world. That is what is truly unique about Java, and there is no other technology that is developed in quite that same way. So we have an active ecosystem involvement with Java developers all around the world, but also that collaborative um, environment that is created through the JCP. So I think it's important for developers to know a little bit about how the JCP works. And I'm sure you've all heard the buzz, the acronyms that we have, TCK, JCP, JSR. So I'll share just a little bit about what those things mean and how it all works together to create this platform that continues to be the number one developer choice year over year. And I think also it's important to touch on what, is it, what it means for you as a developer in your skills and career development. So how getting involved in these types of activities can really help your career. So not only clearly have you made the right choice in picking Java technology to be the platform that you're working on in your development world, but you've also picked the right career. Clearly the demand for tech jobs has grown in the last 15, 20 years and it continues to grow exponentially and we're expecting to have 1.4 million tech jobs by 2020, we barely can keep up with the demand. And I think over the time since Java was first introduced um, 22 years ago, we've also seen a shift in terms of what's expected of a Java developer. Um, clearly, we've seen kind of the expansion and new development areas, areas like Bulgaria, where you're seeing more demand and more companies shift their development to um, other areas outside of the US. Um, but also there's been a shift in terms of what's expected of a computer programmer. Clearly programmers have been around for a long time. Um, the first computer programmer here, I pay homage to Ada Lovelace. Um, but computer programmers are not just expected to have uh, technical skills these days. Clear, clearly you have to keep up with your technical skills, so coming to conferences like this is a really great way to do that. But with the advent of open source development models, we've seen a shift over the last 15 years particularly from only needing technical skills to be in demand and to differentiate yourself as a developer, right? The one with the best technical skills wins. That clearly was the way it used to be 15 years ago. But now more and more, at least half of your time, as a developer is spent more on the communication related tasks, right? So you're in team leader meetings, you're working with developers in other parts of the world. And to be the developer that is clearly differentiating themselves and it's gonna get picked no matter what the cost, no matter how great your technical skills are, I believe the one with the best people skills is the one who wins. Clearly you can't forget about your technical skills, but it's really important to also develop those people skills. And there's lots of uh, research and data to back this up in terms of what are the skills that employers are really looking for these days and how can you really differentiate yourself. And 50% of tech jobs require not only the technical skills but also these soft skills, which you may or may not have heard about. And not every developer has a chance to work on these, but things like communication, critical thinking, adaptability, collaboration and teamwork, and leadership, not just being able to have those hard skills in the technical area. And these skills are not easy to acquire. You can't study, a, um, take a class online or read a book and pick up these kind of soft skills. They require practice. They require human interactions, deep human interactions that you're not necessarily gonna get develop learning about technology. 
You need to be a complex thinker, and you need to ha develop your emotional at intelligence. So if you look at the um, World Economic Forum uh, skills that they say overall are the top skills in the world that you're going to need to be successful in the workplace in the next three years, are really focusing on more of these uh, soft skills, as I like to call them, creativity, coordination, um, negotiation, flexibility, emotional intelligence. So how are you as a developer going to acquire these skills? Many of the things that you can do through the Java community process are ways to develop these skills to practice. So engaging in the community events, coming to conferences like this, working on open source projects, participating in the JCP, coming to hack days, the Bulgarian jug is, is starting to kick off many more of these, and also participating with kids and helping them learn how to code and bringing up that next generation. So I'll share with you about the JCP work, how the JCP works and why you would want to participate. I actually surveyed all of our JCP members that I work with closely over the last year, and I kind of, you know, put out an informal survey and said, why is it that you participate in this activity that is not something you're getting paid for, it's not part of your day-to-day -day job, and you clearly have other demands, personal um, and hobbies, that you could also be using your time to develop. But why is it that you choose to take your off hours time and participate in the Java community process? And these were the things they told me. They're gaining knowledge, so they're learning about the technology that's coming next. So technology that's being developed in the JCP are things that you're going to start using in your work life maybe one to two years down the road. But you're also developing those skills, those soft skills that I just talked to you about that are so important. You're learning teamwork, collaboration, communication. You're learning how to be flexible and work together as part of a team that's not necessarily right where you are in your day-to-day -day job. You're gaining visibility. So the more that you participate in the JCP, you're gaining visibility, not just in your local community, but in the worldwide Java community. You're making the technology that you use every day better, and you're advancing your career while at the same time having fun. So developers have told me this is why they do it, and I think it ties in really well with how you as a developer can grow your career and learn how to differentiate yourself, whether or not you have the top technical skills. If you can balance yourself out and have not just the technical skills, but also those soft skills, you can really advance yourself as a developer and have your choice of career options in the future. And a few people also shared a few thoughts about how it's really helped their career. And I have that available on the, on the website. But one of my favorites is joining the JCP is like becoming a Java citizen. So you can think of it in that way, in that the JCP is the organization that oversees the development of Java, everything in the Java X namespace. Um, but it's also just a way to have membership in the community and be a participant in this global ecosystem. So how does it work, the JCP? Everybody's probably heard the term JSR. JSR is a Java specification request, and every technology is developed as a JSR through the JCP. It's a, basically a project on its own, and it's led by community members with spec leads doing the heavy lifting and being the leader, but with the expert group made up of Java community members serving in helping with the day-to-day -day work that needs to be done to deliver and produce a final JSR. And every JSR delivers not just a specification, but also a reference implementation, which is the code, and a test suite, ensuring that compatibility that, again, is one of the important things that um, contributes to Java's success, is ensuring that backwards compatibility. And that's helpful for developers as well as for customers um, who are implementing the technology it frees them from the lock-in. So the JCP really ties all three of these different things together, and every JSR has those three things. The JSR is developed through a life cycle, so every project follows the same life cycle. Every project has formal public reviews so that we can get that real developer feedback from you in the community. Whether you're a member of the JCP or not, we've change the JCP itself so that you can publicly see what's happening. You can view what's going on in the um, expert group. You can view how the executive committee is voting on every JSR. And you can provide your comments and your thoughts in terms of use cases, whether it's um, how you're going to use the technology, comments on the reference implementation, early access that's available. I'll share with you a little bit more further on what are some specific steps that you can take to get involved. 
And these three things that every JSR delivers really work together to create this compatibility triangle. So without the reference implementation, you'd only have a specification telling you how to use the technology. The reference implementation is really the proof of concept. It's the code telling you whether or not you can build an implementation to that specification. And the TCK, or Technology Compatibility Kit, is telling you, does the RI conform? So if you run your reference implementation against the TCK, is it going to pass? Is it conforming? And is the specification ambiguous in any way? So these three things work together to ensure that it's complete and that it's going to work in the real world. But the other thing that this enables you to do is to have an ecosystem of choice. So again, one of the things about the JCP that is um, very um, unique to other technologies is that it enables independent implementations. It allows you to have a rich ecosystem of choice. So people who choose to have their own implementation can actually take the specification, not look at the reference implementation, build their own implementation, and run it against the TCK. And in that way, you have multiple compatible implementations of a specification. So that's a choice for you. You don't have to just choose the reference implementation that's delivered by the spec lead. You can have many choices in how you want to use this technology. And I'll give you a few examples of how this works to kind of put it into real world um, examples. So we have members all around the world. Um, we already talked about the Bulgarian Jug being a member. Many of your sponsors here are already members. But when the JCP first started, it would only really enable corporations to participate. So um, people like SAP, Software AG, IBM, Sun Microsystems, Oracle, all of those corporations were participating together. But when open source took off, it became important to realize that we had to embrace them in the JCP. So we enabled open source groups to participate, starting with the Apache Software Foundation and now Eclipse Foundation, as well as Java user groups and individual Java developers. So, Java developers are particularly passionate about the technology that they use. They want to get involved. They ha we have this way for them to do it, and they actually want to donate their time and get involved and participate in their off time. So we now actually have three quarters of our membership participating being individual Java developers, not people who are getting paid to do this as part of their job, but people who are passionate about the technology and want to work to make it better. So if you want to join, you can follow the link on the bottom there. You can join and sign up yourself, either as a corporation, your user group's already a member, or yourself as an individual Java developer. Jugs around the world. I just added the Bulgarian jug, and it, it's messed up my slide a little bit there. I'm, I have too many Java user groups to even fit on my slide these days. Um, but many Java user groups around the world are getting involved, not just the Bulgarian jug, but um, Java user groups all across Europe, North America, South America. Africa has been getting more involved lately in Australia. Really, I, I was talking last night, the only continent where I don't have any user groups I'm working with at the moment is, is Antarctica. So if anyone has a contact with the Java user group in Antarctica, let me know. I'll add them on there. I'll have to squish it down and make it a little smaller. But I've been fortunate to be able to work with Java user groups all around the world. And what's really great about this is that you're having not just the perspective of the spec lead, who could be based anywhere in the world, right? But maybe they're in North America. And so with the Java user groups participating, they can collect the feedback from their users and members and then feed it back into the technology before it's final. So you're having the perspective of a worldwide technology, not just the leader who's based in one part of the world, but really pulling in all the different perspectives are all around the world, different languages, different uses, um, different ways that, the, and that they're trying to use the technology. So that, I think, is really cool. And I'm really excited to see the Bulgarian jug up there. And clearly, we have a lot of room to grow, right? I put together a little infographic showing how many members are actually involved in participating actively in the JCP. And as I shared with you earlier, we have millions of Java developers around the world, right? Now, clearly, not every Java developer wants to get involved in the day-to-day -day, um, futures of Java. But I think we have a lot of room to grow here in terms of the numbers and who we could have serving in the JCP. We have about 15,000 users currently. Um, we have 800 members of the JCP. As I said, over three quarters of those are individuals. So we have room to grow there and 60 Java user groups. But all around the world now, we have close to 400 Java user groups. So again, room to grow there. 
and 380 JSR projects. So that can be a little bit overwhelming as we grow and continue to have new JSRs coming. And I'm going to share a little bit about um, which ones are being developed now and how you can find the ones that you can actually actively participate at this moment. So our organization looks a little bit like this chart that I show you. I'm the chair of the organization and we have a program office. We also have our board of directors. So we have an executive committee that votes on every JSR. That means that the spec leads and expert groups can't do whatever they want with Java, right? Every JSR gets voted on by the executive committee. So the spec lead works with the members of the JCP and the expert groups in the blue circles. And then the role of you as Java developers is to give your feedback to these JSR expert groups as they do their work. And then for the, the expert groups to actually produce the drafts that are voted on by the executive committee. So that's the way the organization works. And this just give you a little bit of a picture of, well, so what, are these, what does this group look like? This is our executive committee. We just finished meeting in May, um, earlier this year in North America. We meet three times a year. We're actually considering coming to Sophia next year for one of our face-to-faces in the springtime. So if we're here, we'll definitely organize a meetup so you can meet with some of us. But the cool thing about the executive committee is that it has re representation from all of our different membership categories, right? We have corporations. We have two Java user groups. We have an open source group through Eclipse uh, representation. We also have some end user representation. So Twitter's on there, Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, so some companies that are actually using the technology, not just the vendors, and a couple of individual Java developers. Now, some people often ask me, well, now that Java is open source, why do we still need open standards? And in the JCP, and, um, we really believe that we need both. And we think that these two things cooperate and complement each other. So open source is important, clearly, as a development model. It's important for developers to have access to the code. But standards are important, too. And the reason for this is what I told you about earlier in terms of how the three deliverables work together. We agree on what we're going to standardize on, and we compete on the implementations. So that really does enable that rich ecosystem around Java to grow, which is larger than any other ecosystem in the software development world. It makes it easier to implement the standards, and it also makes it easier for developers to understand the technology, and it creates greater adoption of the standard by having it not just in open source, but also having the specifications and the standardizations. And also the changes that we've seen over time is that we're starting to see projects be developed in open source before they're standardized. So we used to see people come to the JCP and say, I have a technology, I want to standardize it, I'm going to start a JSR, I'm going to write the spec. And these days what you see is you have software being developed in open source projects and people come together and decide, we think we should standardize this. We have enough experience, we have enough different diverse perspectives that we think we should standardize on it. So you're starting with the code first and then you're writing the spec to it later. And both ways work, but even more these days, I think more and more of the work is going to start being done in parallel as we look at ways that we can become more agile and have Java be released in a um, more of a, a yearly cycle versus multiple years in between releases. So I told you I'd give you a couple of examples of what JSRs are and what the implementations are in open source projects. So this gives you a little bit of an example for the reference implementation for the two platforms for Java SE and Java EE are developed in open source projects. So most of you have probably heard of OpenJDK. OpenJDK is the open source project which serves as the reference implementation for the Java SE platform JSR. So the JSR has a spec that's written and developed. It has the RI, which is OpenJDK, and then it has a TCK, which can enable independent implementations of it. And the same thing for the Java EE platform. Project Glassfish serves as a reference implementation for Java EE. There are JSRs for Java EE, which I'm going to get into a few examples of JSRs that are open now that you can comment on. Glassfish is the reference implementation. So there's the spec, the RI, and the TCK. And then I'll give examples of some of the independent implementations that have been developed for Java EE. So our organization works on clearly the technology. That's the most important part. But we also have the 
the responsibility of evolving the organization overall. So we've done some reforms, we've worked on the three platforms, and we've increased community participation. So those are the three things I'm gonna tell you about next. Since I shared with you a little bit about how the JCP works, which I hope you thought was helpful, now I'm gonna get into a little bit of the practical details in terms of what, what are the things that we've been working on in our organization and what has our focus been. So first, as I mentioned, the main work of the JCP is the JSRs. So this gives you a few um, real world examples of technologies developed through the JCP. Now some people say that you know Java ME is dead, but clearly it's not. We had actually um, a major release of Java ME in 2014 14, which really is focused more on the embedded side. So we had an introduction of an embedded profile that was finalized in 2014. And um, we're currently looking at maybe some other ways that we can evolve these technologies more for in Internet of Things and embedded devices versus some of the more traditional uses that people tend to think of Java ME around. So ME is the one platform, EE is the other. So Java EE 7, the, the last release that went final was in 2013. Currently we're working on a new release of Java EE. Java EE 8 is planned to release later this summer. Uh, many developers also say they're not Java EE developers, but I think this slide is really helpful because it breaks it down into the different technologies that are part of Java EE. So you might not use Java EE, the whole platform itself, um, but I bet there's one or two technologies in here that you use every day in your job. So these technologies are all JSRs developed through the JCP. JAXRS has the JSR, Servlet, uh, CDI, EJB, JMS. These are all JSRs that were developed through the JCP and then fed into one umbrella JSR. And the green ones were new, new functionality in Java E7. So some of the new functionality added to Java E7. And then the other um, boxes are technologies that were evolved. So every time a technology changes enough that it can't be maintained, it gets a new number. And again, the ecosystem around Java that was created um, after the release um, has been significant. I think the adoption of Java EE 7 was a little bit slow, but I think over the last year and a half, really you started to see a lot of the compatible application servers get um, released. And that's my example of what I was telling you about earlier, having that choice, right, that the J JSR process enables. So we have multiple choices that are Java EE compatible for developers to choose from and multiple user groups participating and developers all over the world participating in the vibrant Java EE ecosystem. And of course Java SE, Java SE 8 is the last final release um, that was um, developed through the JCP released in March 2014 and again we're working on Java SE 9 now that also is planned to be released later this summer so it's a big year uh, two major Java platform releases planned but this is the one that's um, final most most recently finalized and I think Java SE 8 is really interesting because I think it's an example of how the community really got involved and drove the adoption of the standard. And again, it's a mix between community and technology. There were so many features in Java 8 um, that were highly anticipated and desired by the development community. Lambdas and streams bringing Java into functional programming, a new date and time API, which was badly needed, as well as annotations. So those technical things were driving the adoption, but also the fact that so many developers got involved early in the testing and were giving us feedback before it was released. I think that really um, added to the fast adoption of Java 8. And most of the conferences I go to these days, almost every developer has at least tried Java 8. And, and mainly, maybe it's not in production yet, but at least they've tried it in development. How many people are using Java 8? A lot of hands going up around the room, so there you go. So I would say it's the, it's the most widely adopted Java release that we've ever had. Um, so again, that's you know an ode to the community in terms of getting involved. That really drives the adoption. So those are the three platforms that are finalized, and I'll go into a little bit de of detail about the new ones coming when I talk about community particip participation, the ones that you can get involved in. But the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is how we're changing the JCP overall and making it more inclusive and open for you to get involved in. And that, by that, I'm saying we're changing the Constitution. So we're changing the overall structure of the organization. The JCP has been around for 17 
17 years, which is not as long as Java itself. But the JCP was really an implementation of the way Java was designed from the very beginning, before the, even the first Java release. It was designed to bring in developer feedback. It was de designed to be a language that was gonna involve the community and bring in feedback from the developers so that they could actually use the technology and it could solve real world problems. So the JCP has evolved itself through all this time since the beginning of Java to meet the needs of the developers. And the first thing that we looked at really was, as I said earlier, once we moved to an open source uh, licensing model for Java, we still were using the JCP, which was more of a, of a closed process, which was you know, fitting with how it used to be developed. But we hadn't changed the JCP structure to make things more open, more transparent to the community. So one of the first things that we did was we eliminated the closed workings of expert groups. So now anyone who wants to see what's happening in a JSR expert group can do so. And we did that by requiring that expert groups operate with open issue trackers that anyone can view, as well as open expert group discussions. So that all used to be done um, behind closed doors and only for expert group members. Now that's all in the open, so anyone can go and view the work of JSRs as they're being developed. The second thing was we used to have a little bit more oversight um, through the executive committee, and that really didn't make sense anymore, so we wanted to eliminate that heavyweight process and oversight by merging our executive committees. So now we have one executive committee, that was the picture I showed you earlier, one executive committee to make things work a little bit smoother, have less oversight. And then the third thing we did is look at how can we broaden our membership, right? As I told you earlier, when the JCP first started, it was really more designed for corporations to participate, but over time, we've enabled not only corporations, but also open source groups, Java user groups, and individual developers to participate, where now that's the largest segment of our membership, the individual Java developers. So what we looked at with this last effort was, now that we've made it possible for individuals to join, how can we eliminate any barriers that might exist? So what we looked at was taking away any fees to participate, so no fees to participate in the JCP for anyone, whether you're a corporation, a user group, or an individual. We also made it easier to join, so for individuals it used to be a long agreement that you had to sign if you wanted to participate in the JCP and you had to get your employer's permission, and that turned out to be a barrier. So we introduced new levels of membership enabling an electronic signature, a short agreement, as well as no employer signature being required. And also adding a way for those types of members to be recognized, because as I talked about earlier in terms of how to grow your career, and the visibility you're gonna get through participating in the JCP, one of the unique advantages is if you're an expert group member, you get recognized on the JSR page for the life of the JSR. It will stay there forever in history. And that creates the sense of expert for you. You're an expert in this technology and people use it to point to it on their CV, right? So we, now that we're adding more types of membership, we wanna have those people recognized as contributors. So now with JSRs, we're gonna have not just the spec lead and the expert group member, but a third category, which is contributors for JSRs. So people will be recognized as a contributor and you will stay there on the JSR page as well as adding some seats on the executive committee for individual Java developers. So it's really important that for us to look at ways that are things, barriers that are um, keeping people from participating. That was really our main focus of this. And in the end, what we came up with was, it's not one size fits all anymore. Um, we still have our full members, and full members can still join and participate in the JCP. They can serve on expert groups, they can lead JSRs, they can serve on our executive committee. But we also have two other types of membership now. A lighter weight membership for associates who want to be listed as contributors, that's individual developers and also a different membership agreement for Java user groups. So most Java user groups are organized not to be a legal entity, they're more like meetup groups, and it doesn't really make sense for them to be signing a long and lengthy um, legal agreement. So we have a partner member for a Java user group. No fee, really simple, lightweight agreement, you can sign up online. So that was the uh, jcp.next effort. We continue to work on things, so I encourage you to submit your ideas for new ways that we can change. We actually have three working groups going right now that are looking at ways we can be more agile to uh, enable faster Java releases, as well as looking at um, ways that we can be more collaborative with the community as we evolve the organization itself. 
So how will you participate? This is where I have a, a six-step um, process of how you can participate and what are some of the JSRs you can get involved in right now, starting today, after you walk out of this talk. So you can do it on your own, that's fine, but I really encourage you to get involved with your Java user group or with a group of developers in your, at your employer and work together to help each other to achieve more because I think when you work together, you really can achieve more. So the first step is pick a JSR. As I, start, as I told you earlier, we have 380 JSRs, so clearly that's a little bit overwhelming. But really, at any point in time, there are maybe 10 JSRs that are being developed and actively worked on. And I think that's true in this case as well. As I said, there are many JSRs getting ready to be finalized this summer. Um, but if you go to the active JSRs link on jcp.org, you'll find it broken down by JSR. So many of these are Java EE-related JSRs, so targeted for Java EE 8. Um, so I list them here with the title and the number, and then there's a couple of JSRs targeted for Java SE 9, um, JSR 376 and 379, and um, even a couple standalone JSRs. So Desktop Application API is a standalone JSR, so not everything is part of a Java release, although we tend to see these days most JSRs are targeted for a major platform release. So the majority of these are targeted for Java E8 or Java SE9. So pick one of these JSRs. Um, Java E8, um, that proposal is, has over 15 JSRs. There's a talk later in the conference by David Delabasse where you can get a deep dive into all of these JSRs, but essentially the um, focus is making a migration path, path to the cloud and to microservices as well as ensuring backward compatibility with Java EE. So you can pick any one of these JSRs that are targeted. Um, they're all available as JSRs, and the previous slide shows you how you can get involved with these. Many of these are in the um, public review proposed final draft. A couple are even in um, final release at this point. So it's a really ti good time to get in there, pick the technology that you're using in your day-to-day -day job or one that you want to learn about. Pick one and download the latest draft, play with the early access reference implementation, get ahead of the curve in terms of what's coming next in the next year that's going to be used through your um, Java development. Java 9, JDK 9, another big step forward. 122 Java enhancement proposals are targeted for Java 9, but as everyone knows, the big thing is modularity, so that's encapsulated in JEP 261. Um, that's available as early access, and over the last year, we've really been focusing on getting developers to download the early access builds. And the team's been really great about putting out those builds every couple of weeks, right? Current available builds um, up to over 170 at this point. But one of the ways that you can get involved with that is to download the early access build and provide your feedback against it. Run your applications against it and see what happens. And give your feedback. So. Java 9 has modularity. Clearly, that's the big thing. That's this image portrays. But there also are a lot of other things going into Java 9, which you might want to take a look at. Some of the more interesting ones to most developers are the J Shell and J Link. So you might want to take a look at those. Those are incorporated into the early access builds, but if you want to get a deeper dive into those, as I said, the reference implementation is developed in OpenJDK. So if you go to OpenJDK, those are the two JEPs that you might want to take a look at, 222 and 282. Um, see what's coming there. And there's lots of other improvements going into Java 9. Um, not just modularity. So pick the JSR that you're interested in. Um, that's the first step. Every project JSR has a page that looks just like this one. And at the top, you're going to find a link to the latest drafts. And then you're going to find a link to the transparency. So you'll find your issue tracker as well as your public communications forum. So you can see what's being worked on currently. And then communicate. So it's really important. Some developers think that their feedback is not important, but it really is important to communicate. So it's a great first step to download and view and um, get up to speed on what's happening with the technology, but you really do need to share what you, what you think about it. So that's communication. It's a two-way street. And it's a really important part of the feedback loop and what makes the JCP successful. So these are some of the things that you can provide feedback on. Okay, um, so I told you already that there's a list as well as a public issue tracker. So 
get up to speed on those, and then share your ideas and feedback. So they are open. You are uh, allowed to, to comment there. You can also read the early version of the specification. And again, these can be lengthy, especially for the platform specifications. But what I encourage people to do is pick one part of it. So you don't need to review the whole thing. You can pick a part that's relevant to you and provide your feedback on that section. So download it, read it, and provide your feedback. And it can be as things as minor as reading for spell checking and typos. The third thing that I suggest that you do is try um, downloading the early access builds. So at this stage, all of these JSRs have early access reference implementations available through the link to their project page. So download the reference implementation and some of the things that you can do for the newer things are also try writing some sample applications. So sample applications can be really useful um, in driving adoption. So um, write or speak about the technology, that's the fourth thing. Um, in your local language, that can be really helpful. Some user groups have found it really helpful to drive the adoption by translating into your local language. So give a talk in your local language, at your employer, at your user group. One of the great ways to advance your career is to do small talks and become an expert in, a, in one of the technologies. Even if you don't know it already, you can actually learn about it and give a talk. That's one of the more uh, useful things that some of the experts who are participating in the Java community have shared with me is that it's a really good way to become an expert to actually just learn about it and develop a talk about it. So that's helpful to drive adoption overall and it also helps you grow your career by writing about a technology and encouraging other, others to get involved with it. You can also do things like promote the technology in social media. So let people know you've downloaded the early access build and this is what you thought of it or provide some um, pertinent links to a blog in terms of your experience doing it. So that will help not only grow awareness, but it will um, put you as a leader in that field. And lastly, if you wanna help out with the documentation, that's always something that the expert groups are um, willing to accept help from you if you want to get involved in that. So those are my top ways to get involved, but don't be limited by these um, suggestions. These really were things that I learned from spec leads and expert group members, as well as members of the community, things that they've done and contributed and that were helpful. And what I find for most spec leads, and that's part of my job as well, working with spec leads, is that they wish they got more feedback. So I would encourage you not to be shy um, or hesitant about participating because what the spec leads and expert group members are looking for is more, not less feedback from the community. So I encourage you to take a look at this list and find something that you think you can get involved in. Pick one JSR and pick one action and see if you can follow up on it in the next couple of months before the major releases. So just to give you an idea what it's gonna look like in Issue Tracker, most of them are, we're using Jira, although as you may or may not be aware, um, the Jira instance for Java EE is being tr migrated to GitHub, so this will, this will change um, what the, the Issue Tracker is gonna look like, but the GitHub Issue Tracker is really similar. So you'll see here um, that the spec leads use an Issue Tracker heavily to drive the work of JSR development. So I think one of the best places to start is in the issue tracker. So read some of the issues, make sure the thing you wanna comment on isn't already listed in the issue tracker and then comment on the issue. If you don't see anything that addresses your need, go ahead and create a new issue. And share resources on GitHub. As I mentioned, there's a uh, Java EE organization on GitHub. There's also an adopt a JSR organization on GitHub. So um, the Bulgarian Jug has gotten involved with the GitHub organization. The Java EE JSRs are all on GitHub. So if you wanna have one place to go, if you're interested in any of those technologies on Java EE, this is the link to go there and find out about that. So you'll find links to all the projects, you'll find the issue trackers, you'll find the um, early access builds, and and you'll also get access to the mailing list there on that organization. And participate in hack days. Um, we have virtual hack days as well as in-person hack days. So if you can't participate here locally in your Bulgarian Jug hack days, we did do a Java 9 virtual hack day on the 22nd of April, and we plan to have another one on the 19th of August. Um, this actually is not a Java 9 hack day. This is a picture from a CDI hack day that we did in London. And I show this just because 
I want to show you that you don't need hundreds of people to participate in a hack day. When we do our virtual hack days, we do have close to 500 developers participating. But some of the best hack days that I've heard about and participated in have had five developers. And even in the London Java community, some of their best hack days have been a smaller group of developers. So if you get just a few developers that you work with in your job or somebody in your user group or someone you've met here at the conference and you get together and share a passion about a particular technology, you can get together and provide your feedback. It's really helpful. And in the process, you're going to be having fun. So that's um, what you can do to get involved. Um, there is an actual adoption group as part of OpenJDK. I think that's important to part out, point out. And that actually has evolved through the adopt a JSR program. So now we have a project as part of OpenJDK. It's called the adoption group. So you can get involved in that and you can find out about what's coming next. So we're, they're already working on things beyond Java 9. So the things that are gonna be coming will be Project Valhalla and Project Panama. So you can get involved in the adoption group and find out what's coming next after Java 9. And you can do that on openjdk.java.net. As I mentioned earlier, all of the Java EE things have migrated to GitHub, but OpenJDK will stay here at openjdk.java.net. So adopt a JSR. I wanted to highlight a little bit of the work that's going on with adopt a JSR. I have just a few minutes left, but I'll just share with you that I'm really happy to see the Bulgarian jug get involved in adopt a JSR because what I've seen with user groups is really given them a lot of attention in the local industry as well as on a broader scale, and it helps them to attract developers. So. Um, I'm happy to see and include the Bulgarian jug in my use cases in terms of things that have happened. You've already adopted CDI 2.0, so that's JSR 365. You had a full hack day event here with the spec lead of CDI from Red Hat in March, and I know other events are planned, so um, join the mailing list and get involved. Um, the London Java community has really been a leader of this activity and they are doing many hack days around Java 9 and we've done a couple of them virtually as well. More planned in August and September. And the Paris Jug, which you have um, a speaker here, Jose, he's here from Paris. Um, Java 9 Hack Day as well, they have more events planned so they've been getting involved as well as the Belgium Jug working on Java EE. And in Brazil, um, they're very active and doing lots of hack days, as well as coder dojos and translations into Portuguese. So that's something that's been really important contribution for them to their local community is to have resources in their local language, as well as in India. So um, seeing them get involved in creating some sample applications. So that's something that you can do as well. So have fun with the technology and create sample applications um, before it's released. So we need you to get involved with adopt a JSR. I'm happy to see that you already did get involved and I hope that you'll be encouraged to either take some of these actions on your own or get involved through the Bulgarian jug and participate more. I leave you with some links and I think we have four minutes for questions. Uh, so if anyone has a question, I'll take those. These links uh, should help you out um, if I don't have time for your question and I'll be here the rest of the day as well. And you can also, also contact me on Twitter. My Twitter is HeatherVC. I also do the JCP um, Twitter, which is JCP underscore org. So you can follow that if you have any questions. Um, yes? Well, um, when deciding on uh, accepting a GSR, executive committee needs to have some r general rules. Yes. Do you know what are those? and uh -huh. uh, what's the driver of the evolution of Java? Is it just random mutations because uh, different languages have different features and we, Java needs to adopt those or it's more general? Uh, Okay. Well, yes. So as I mentioned, every JSR gets voted on by the executive committee. And that first vote is when a JSR gets accepted. That's the first vote. The second one is after public release. And then the third one at final release. And um, some of the things that the executive committee looks at for a JSR is ensuring that there is an overlap with something already that exists in the ecosystem, right? So if something already exists as a project, we'll direct them towards, you know, that previous version and ask them to get in, get in touch with that spec lead and see if you can evolve it through that previous version, do a new version, basically a new JSR. Um, the other thing is ensuring that there's a wide representation or is it is it ready to standardize? So that's kind of the next two things. So 
maybe the second one would be, is it ready for standardization? Do we have enough experience with this yet, right? So sometimes we tell people, go back and get a little bit more experience in open source before you decide to standardize on it. And then the third thing is, do you have enough um, diverse viewpoints to go forward with this and enough people interested in getting involved with this? Like one of the most recent things is around um, artificial intelligence, right? Visual recognition. So that's one area where people are thinking about um, proposing JSRs and probably a JSR will get submitted later this year uh, in that area. But you know, are, are you, you know, starting small enough as you go into new areas? Um, so that's, that's probably the criteria. And then as far as the major Java releases, well, there's a, there's a whole architect architecture group that oversees what goes into Java releases and what um, is proposed as a JSR. Um, but in general, the design principles of Java are to be careful and deliberate, right? I mean, so I think you know, there are tough choices that need to be made, and clearly, you know, with the backward compatibility, that always has to be taken into account, right? So it's not necessarily, oh, this cool new thing's happened, we're going to do it in Java, right? So you have a whole thing that you have to keep in mind across the ecosystem, but I do know that, you know, we've been talking about in the executive committee um, that we're trying to move to a faster release cycle for Java, and how can we evolve the JCP to enable that, and so it would be less about oh, this release is going to be, like for Java 9, we're talking about modularity, right? So it's going to be modularity, and then, you know, until we get that right, it won't go in, right? It was the same thing for Java 8. It was Lambdas and Streams API, right? So it wasn't until it was done that we, that release goes, right? So moving to a more agile development model where it's, you know, more regular releases. So that's currently something that we're looking at. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm around the rest of the day, so feel free to come up to me and ask any questions I didn't have a chance to address since we are out of time. <laughs> All right. Thank you.